welcome again to Inspiration, the Bible's Greatest Stories. In this 10-part series, we're looking at some of the most important and fascinating stories in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New, not only talking about how God has led in the lives of individuals, but we're also learning wonderful principles about God's grace and His power and His forgiveness as we look at these various Bible stories. We are so glad that you are here this evening. I'd like to welcome those who are joining us online across the country and around the world, and also the folks who are watching on the various television networks. A very warm welcome to all of you. Now, we're uploading this program live from Las Vegas, and we're in Pacific Time Zone, so we need to let you know, tonight we will be moving our clocks forward by one hour for daylight saving. So those of you in North America, you are familiar with this. Just a reminder, move your clock forward tonight because we do have a prog program tomorrow, and that's going to be at 7 o'clock Pacific time. So if you want to catch the program live, you need to adjust your clock. Well, before we get to our presentation this evening, I'd like to invite our song leaders to come out. We have a theme song, Wonderful Words of Life. We're talking about the Bible and the wonderful words in the Scriptures. So join us as we sing. You can remain seated but sing with gusto, wonderful words of life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me know their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words. I want to remind you about our free gift that we have. The book entitled Riches of His Grace. If you ever wondered about the grace of God and how we can receive that wonderful grace, you want to get the book. For those who are joining us online or watching on the various networks, if you'd like to receive a free copy of the book, all you need to do is text the word forgiveness to the number 40544. You'll then receive a digital copy of the book. If you're outside of North America, just visit the website greateststories.org and you'll be able to download a copy of the book, read it, and share it with somebody else. For those of you who are here in person, you'll receive your book as you leave today. Well, before we get to our study, we always want to begin with prayer. The reason for that is because the Bible is God's book, and if we are to correctly understand it, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us. So let's just bow our heads as we pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of the stories that we find in the Bible, true stories of lives that have been transformed by your Across the country and around the world, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, at this time, I would like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward. Have you been blessed by the presentation so far? Yeah. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you, I, as I mentioned, I think on the opening night, Pastor Doug, this is one of my favorite series. So I'm just delighted to hear these wonderful stories and the various lessons that come out of it. And I know what the program's about tonight. It's called At Jesus' Feet, and you will be blessed. So thank you, Pastor Doug. Thank you, Pastor Ross, and good evening, friends. It's so good to see each of you here in the Paradise Church in Las Vegas. And again, want to welcome those who are watching on the various networks and social media. Uh, we've heard that there are thousands and thousands of people just watching on social media. And you add up those watching overseas and around the world and the different networks. And it's a mind-boggling number. So it's wonderful to be able to speak to a coliseum full of people from this friendly church. Amen. And that's really what's happening. 
Well, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, not so much a particular stories, but a series of vignettes about a great Bible character. And that person is Mary. It's sometimes known as Mary Magdalene. And uh, I, I was so fascinated as I went through the Bible and I found out that and this is in, in many ways the most devoted disciple of Jesus. Now you notice I didn't say apostle because Mary was not an apostle, but she was a disciple. And to see where the Lord brought her from and led her to, I just found it so inspiring. I wrote a book about, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago called At Jesus' Feet, The Gospel According to Mary Magdalene. Because you study, and there's about seven times that Mary appears in the Gospels with Jesus, almost always at his feet at some point in the story. And I'll tell you up front what they are. Here's what our assignment is tonight. We're going to see Mary at Jesus' feet in shame. Mary at Jesus' feet in study. Mary at Jesus' feet in sorrow, in sacrifice, in surrender, in service, and in song. And you're going to see there's about 12 times you find the phrase Mary Magdalene, but Mary Magdalene is not the only time that she appears, that not only under that name. And so let's begin our study by going with me to the book of John, Gospel of John, chapter 8, and we'll start with the first verse. And this is a, um, a, a, an amazing passage of Scripture. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. It doesn't give her name, but you'll see later on it talks about something that happened with Mary. And one gospel just says, a certain woman. You'll understand why as we proceed. Caught in the act of adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. It's not like, you know, rumors going around. And it says, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, tempting him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. Now, what they're doing is the religious leaders were very jealous of Jesus and his popularity and his power, his influence with the people. Even Pilate, during the trial of Christ, it says he knew that they handed him over because of jealousy. And they're trying to find some way to take Jesus out. And they thought, well, if we do it, the mob's going to be mad at us because the people love him. We've got to get the Romans to do it. And only the Romans, since they occupied Israel, only the Roman courts could pronounce a death sentence. But according to the Jewish law, if a person was caught in the act of adultery, man or woman, they were to be stoned. And so they thought, we will set this woman up. We know she's got a reputation. And uh, we'll bring her to the temple. And when Jesus says, yes, the law of Moses says stone her, we'll stone her. Then we'll run to the Romans and say, you know, this religious teacher says that he doesn't have to obey the law of Caesar. He just pronounced the death penalty on somebody. The Romans would arrest him. If Jesus said, no, we're not allowed to do that because the Romans, then they get the people all upset because they think he's loyal to the Romans. They thought, we've got him. There's no way out. So this is a very clever trap. And so there's this woman who I believe is Mary Magdalene. Now let me explain. Um, sometimes she's just called Mary, Mary of Bethany. She has a family that is in uh, Jerusalem, Lazarus, a sister named Martha, and she stays with him. She has fallen in her life and she set up business in a place called Magdala. Magdala is on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's where the Roman soldiers went for vacation and they had a lot of brothels there. And to say that someone is Mary from Magdala is, pardon me, it's like saying Mary from the Strip, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. Uh, my friends are in Las Vegas in case you wonder what I'm talking about. <laughs> and they're just the two words tell a story all by themselves. This happens during a feast when there's a crowd in Jerusalem and there's business in Jerusalem. And so she's set up. They don't care about her. They're going to use her. They're willing to kill her to make a point. So they set it up. You notice the man is not there. If you're caught in the act, last time I checked, that requires at least two people. 
right? But he's not there. And helps us understand this is a trap. And all of a sudden, can you imagine you're in one of the most personal circumstances and all the religious leaders charge in. And before you can get yourself together, they drag you off to the holiest place in the world with everyone gawking. And they throw you down at the feet of the holiest man who's ever lived. That's got to be a mortifying experience. So this is what's going on. You only find this story here in the Gospel of John. Now Moses said she should be stoned, but what do you say? But Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. You know, I don't think Jesus likes it very much when we accuse one another. And here they were pointing fingers at Mary, and though she was guilty, he wasn't. And then he's writing. You have to ask yourself the question, what is Jesus writing? Now, it doesn't tell us, but we can make a pretty educated guess. There's three times in the Bible when God writes. God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger on stone. God wrote judgment on the walls of Babylon. When that handwriting on the wall, you've heard that story. And here Jesus is now writing sins in the dust of the temple floor. In the Jewish temple, they had white and black marble, kind of like a checkerboard, big squares. And on the black stones, because of the dust and the traffic of the people, you could write very clearly. So he's writing. And I think he's writing the sins of, his of her accusers. So he's acting like he doesn't hear them, but they continue to press him. They're not paying attention to what he's writing. They figure he's just doodling, you know, while they're talking to him. And so they press him. When they continued asking him, I'm in John chapter 8, verse 7, he raised himself up. He's got to be careful when Michael stands up. He raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And then he stooped down again and wrote. And he starts to write their particular sins. And while they're figuring out how to respond to what he says, they look at what he's writing, and he's writing very specific things that only God would know about them. And as they hear his challenge and they read their sins, one by one, the rocks they had brought to throw at Mary fall from their paralyzed hands, and they go out, beginning at the eldest, because they had the longest record of sin, even unto the least. One by one, they went out, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. At this point, she stood up. She was cast at his feet before when Jesus raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman. He said to her, woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? Now, was that because she wasn't guilty? She wasn't. She was guilty, but uh, there was no man there to condemn her. She said, no one, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn you. Okay, a lot of people stop right there. And people go, whoopee, Jesus said adultery is okay. That's not what he said. Jesus told us, I did not come into the world to condemn the world. We're already condemned. We have sinned and the penalty is death. And the condemnation is God sends light into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Uh, we are already under a death sentence. He didn't come to condemn. He says, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. So he said, I don't condemn you. I didn't come for that reason. He said, go, you're forgiven. You're free and sin no more. Amen. He said, what you have done is a sin. How could Jesus say that? Didn't the law of Moses matter? Didn't it still stand true that adultery was a sin? Yes, it did. and if everyone was to die right now who is guilty of sin, this room would be empty because the Bible says all have sinned. And any sin, the penalty is death. Sometimes we, you know, accentuate some sins above the others, but they all put Jesus on the cross. And so he said, go and sin no more. I think that there was an unspoken communication that she picked up through the Holy Spirit that the reason that he could let her go free is because he was going to take her penalty. And that's the only reason that you and I go free. She ended up following him. 
The Bible tells us there's several women that followed Jesus, administered of their substance. And it later tells us Mary of Bethany was a woman who had a bad reputation. And people said, don't let her touch you, for she is a sinner. And I think that John, wanting to protect her identity because she was a prominent person in the church, told the story. The others left the story out. John told the story, but he said, I'm not going to mention her name. And from that moment on, she began to follow Jesus. And she heard Jesus say many times why she followed him to the apostles. He probably said it half a dozen times. I'm going to Jerusalem. I will be betrayed into the hands of sinners. I'll be crucified and I'll rise the third day. She understood that he was going to die for her sins. I think she had a, an understanding that the others did not have. So here we see Mary in her first encounter with Jesus. She's in the temple and she's in shame. You know, a lot of people say, Pastor Doug, if I went to the church, it would fall in because I'm so sinful. Just like the temple of Dagon with Samson. They're afraid of coming into the temple. But you know, the best place to go when you're in trouble is to the presence of God. This is what Mary did, and he forgave her there. So if you know anybody that thinks, oh, I'm just not good enough to go to church, that is really silly. That's like parents telling their children, could you please clean up so you can take a bath? You don't clean up so you can take a bath. You take a bath so you can clean up. Some people think I've got to straighten out my life so I can come to Jesus. Well, you don't straighten out your life so you can come to Jesus. You come to Jesus so you can straighten out. Amen. I heard about this one man that pastor kept inviting him to church. His family came, his wife came, but he didn't come. He said, Pastor, when I get things straightened out, I'll come. When I get things straightened out, I'll come. Finally, he came, all straightened out, in a coffin. <laughs> you don't want to wait that long, friends. You want to come to Jesus. And don't be afraid to come to that holy place. So we see Mary, she's in shame in the temple. And he said, I don't go. I have not come to condemn you, but to save. Now, just want to make a point here. You said, Pastor Doug, you say Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene are the same person. I believe so. And it's for biblical reasons. Let me give you a little list of why. Who is Mary Magdalene? Well, first of all, it says both Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene, it says they are women that have means. They've got money. And you'll see that they buy an expensive gift. Both, of course, have the name Mary, but that was not that uncommon. That's sort of the Greek name for Miriam. A lot of Jews use that. They're both unmarried. They're both always at Jesus' feet. They both evidently have bad reputations. And then, most interestingly, you never hear them mentioned in the same story but they both seem incredibly devoted. It's because they're the same person. Sometimes Jesus is called Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus the carpenter's son. They've got several names. Simon's called Simon. Simon's called Peter. Sometimes Jesus calls him Simon the son of Jonah. And so sometimes they use different names, but this, I think, is the same Mary. Now, the next time we observe her at Jesus' feet, you have to turn in your Bible to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. And this is, I think, one of the most important things. First, she has this encounter with the Lord in the house of the Lord and um, is transformed by this. So you read in verse 38, Luke chapter 10, Now it happened that as they went, he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary. Notice it's Martha's house, but Mary's there. She had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she finally approaches Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? You know, Jesus often would go and stay at the house of Mary and Lazarus, that was her brother, in Bethany, not far from the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when Jesus showed up, he brought 12 friends with him, and men that eat a lot, they're young. And there's a lot of serving and cooking going on. This may have also been the same time where it says there was a dinner in Bethany and Mary's there as well. So anyway, Martha's always serving. And I just am so thankful for the Marthas in the church that are they're good servants. They're busy. They're active. But there's a danger. You can get so busy doing the work of the Lord, you forget the Lord of the work. And we are not saved by our works. We are saved by a relationship with Jesus. You know, when the Lord comes, Jesus is going to declare to a lot of people, I don't know you. And they're going to say, but Lord, 
We taught in your streets. We cast out devils. We did many wonderful works. We cooked for potlucks. We worked in, with the deacons. And, and those are all great things. But he'll say, I don't know you. How do you get to know somebody? You know, first of all, very simple truth. If you forget everything else I say tonight, please remember this. You cannot be saved if you don't obey God. Listen, you can't obey God unless you love Him. You're not saved by obeying Him, but if you love Him, you will obey Him. Amen. You cannot love God if you don't know Him. You're not going to love Him and know Him unless you communicate with Him. He speaks to you through His Spirit, but principally through His Word. Amen. Sometimes even preachers, believe it or not. <laughs> you speak to Him when you pray. If you're going to fall in love with someone, you need to communicate. Some people not. You speak to him when you pray. If you're going to fall in love with someone, you need to communicate. Some people are wanting to fall in love with Jesus and they're not letting Jesus talk to them. They're doing all the talking. You ever know anyone like that? <laughs> so, Lord, give me this and give me that and give me to keep me out of trouble, save me from this, save me from that. But they're not listening. God speaks to us through his word. She sat at Jesus' feet a posture of submission, humility, worship, and heard his word. And Martha said, and Martha said, make her get up and help me work for you. And listen to what Jesus says, Martha, Martha. You can tell he loves her. You don't want to insult the person that's your host, you know. You are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. One thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken from her. I'm not going to chase her away. She's sitting at my feet drinking in the Word. You know, friends, this is one of the most important things that happens is when the Word of God is open and God speaks to us, the Bible is inspired. So we're titling the series Inspiration. The Word of God is inspired. And I've been at programs before and camp meetings where I'm sitting on the platform, I'm waiting to preach, and there is a parade of announcements and programs and products and things that go by, and everybody's looking at their watch, and I can see they're getting hungry and hear their stomachs growl and their watches are going off. Finally, 10 minutes to 12, they say, and now, Pastor Doug, if you could bring us the Word. <laughs> and I feel like just standing and doing the benediction and thank them for coming <laughs> because they're all worn out now. And we kind of give the word. Anyone, can you say amen? <laughs> you know what I'm talking <laughs> And sometimes I think, I'm going to preach, and you do all your announcements for anyone that wants to stay and hear them. <laughs> we, we may do that at our church. <laughs> so, but she wanted to hear the word. We need a devotional life. And the morning is the best time. God rained down bread from heaven for the children of Israel every morning. They had to go out and gather it and knead it and bake it and work it and chew it. But he provided it, but they had to fetch it. And God, has, His Word, the Bible says, it's not very far from you. We need to reach out. And today you're without excuse because if you say, I can't read, well, you, you can hear. You can just have your phone read the Bible to you now. You can get a CD and listen in your car. We do that also. Good sermons. And uh, apps will read the Bible to you, but study the Word. And God will speak to you through His Word. The Bible changed my life. Atheists started reading the Bible and just transformed my life. I realized it was, uh, and I'd read a lot of religious books. There's nothing like the Bible. Spend time with God in the morning. You've got a physical body that has physical needs. You have a spiritual body that has spiritual needs. I remember I was... Uh, living on the streets shortly after becoming a Christian. I told you I lived in a cave and sometimes stayed in abandoned buildings and I was in Palm Springs and there was a dedicated Christian man there. We all called him Brother Harold. I don't even know what his whole name was. It was Brother Harold. He was a Jewish convert to Christianity and the guy was such a committed Christian he would wake up every morning at like three or four and start reading his Bible. He could read it in Greek, Hebrew, and English. He'd then go to the hospital and he would quote scripture from memory to the people he was a self-appointed chaplain. He'd go to the Palm Springs Hospital, visit the rooms, encourage people, pray with him, quote scripture to him. And I heard him quote scripture, his voice would tremble. Just the fact that he could take the word of God on his lips moved him. I saw him praying, his face would light up. This man knew the Lord. So I'm walking down the street one day and he knew me because I, I used to hang around the streets and he was 
cared a lot about all the young, we call them Jesus freaks, these young teenagers that had come to Christ. And he saw me, he stopped me, he said, Doug, how are you doing? I was struggling a little bit, trying to live right. And he said, Doug, how long can you hold your breath? I didn't know why he asked me that, but I was glad because I was very proud of how long I could hold my breath. Even when I was smoking, I could hold my breath for four minutes and 10 seconds because I used to do free diving. And uh, I said, four minutes and 10 seconds. I expected him to be impressed. He said, you shouldn't go any longer than that without praying. <laughs> he said, how often do you eat? I said, two or three times a day. He said, that's how often you should read or meditate on God's Word. Amen. I said, what's going to happen, Doug, if you don't get any exercise? So I get weak and flabby. So that's what happens to your faith if you don't use it and you don't share it. So you've got a physical body with physical needs and there are laws that you cannot deny and you will suffer if you ignore those laws. You have a spiritual body. It is real and you have spiritual needs and you will suffer if you do not obey those laws. You need to read the Word of God. That is the bread of life. You need to pray. That is the, uh, the altar of incense. That is the breath. And you need to exercise your faith. In the holy place of the Jewish temple, there were three things. There was a candlestick. You got to let your light shine. Exercise your faith. There was an altar of incense. That's prayer. And there was a table with bread on it. That's the Word of God. These are the three disciplines in the Christian life. You do those things and you will live. Amen. You will grow. Babies don't worry about growing, do they? They breathe. They don't breathe. You have a very sad occurrence. They eat, they wiggle, they grow. If you're doing those things, you will grow in your faith. Show me a backslidden Christian. I'll show you someone who's neglecting one of those three things. Mary sat at Jesus' feet and she heard the word. We see her not only at his feet in shame, we see her at his feet in study. After you come to the Lord, you need to study. Then... We see her next, she's at Jesus' feet. Now she's in sorrow because after she has been fed and after she has been saved, she's now worried about her brother. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 11 now. And I think just about everyone here knows the story of one of Jesus' greatest miracles. It is the resurrection of Lazarus. And it tells us Jesus had a friend named Lazarus that was sick. He was the brother of Mary and Martha. They sent a message to Jesus from Bethany way up to the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, and said, your friend that you love is sick. Well, Jesus is healing everybody right and left. He's going through towns where everybody's been healed. They thought Jesus is going to drop everything and come down and heal him, but he doesn't. He deliberately waits because sometimes God allows us to experience uh, a real hard time in order to strengthen our faith. So finally, Lazarus dies. And Martha and Mary are just so devastated, not only about the death, but that Jesus didn't come. And it says that finally, he comes down four days after Lazarus is dead and buried. And it says that when Mary heard that he had come, Martha found him and said, Lord, if you had been here, my, you could have healed my brother. Jesus said, your brother will live again. She said, I know he's going to be raised up at the last day. By the way, Lazarus was asleep. That's how the Bible refers to death. That would be terrible if Lazarus had gone right to heaven and Jesus brought him back to the grave. You wouldn't do that to your friend, would you? <laughs> the Bible said he was asleep in the grave. And Martha said, I know he'll rise in the resurrection of the last day. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. This is Matthew, um, uh, John eleven twenty five. 25. He that believes in me, though he may die, yet he will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's still true today, friends. If you believe in Jesus, you'll never die. She said, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Then Mary hears that Jesus has come. A messenger goes to the funeral and tells her she runs out to see Jesus. And you go to verse 32. Then Mary came to where Jesus was. She saw him. She fell down at his feet. Interesting. She's always there. Saying, Lord... If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, there she is again weeping at his feet. You know, sometimes we must be broken. Broken things bring forth life. 
It's broken grain that gives us bread, and it's broken clouds that give us rain, and it's sometimes it's a broken alabaster vial that brings forth the sweet perfume. We're getting to that in just a minute. And it's a broken heart and broken tears that bring a new life. Sometimes before a new birth, there's tears. And Mary's weeping for her brother that's dead. Now, we discovered in a previous study that there's a lot of people that are dead in trespasses and sins. And the Bible tells us that uh, that is a symbol for death. When a person is lost, it represents death. And so here she is weeping at his feet. You and I have brothers and sisters out there in the world. We've got children and friends that are dead. What is Mary doing with Jesus for those that she loves? She's praying at his feet. She's weeping and pleading for her brother that is dead, that Jesus would do something miraculous and bring him back to life. And does he do it? Jesus leads them to the place where he's dead. He tells Martha, roll away the stone. Martha, you know, she's very practical. She's the servant. And she says, you realize, Lord, he's been dead for four days and it's not going to smell very good. Jesus said, did I tell you to trust me? He said, roll away the stone. And Jesus spoke those words and he said, Lazarus, come forth. If Jesus had not specified Lazarus, come forth, every grave in the world would have opened up if he had just said, come forth. <laughs> he said, Lazarus, come forth. And they heard a stirring inside and then out from the darkened hole, all of a sudden this mummy began to hobble. It says, he was all wrapped up. And Jesus said, loose him. And sometimes after we're raised, we still need to be loosed. And there was just pandemonium of rejoicing through their prayers to Jesus for their dead loved ones. There was new life. Some of you have been praying for people and you think the situation is hopeless. You don't get more hopeless than someone being dead for four days. Their life may stink like a corpse, but Jesus can cause a resurrection. Now, what does a woman represent in Bible analogies? Who knows? It's very common. This is like Bible study 101. The Bible says, husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And um, in the same way, the church is to be praying for Christ or for those who are dead in sin. This is one of our most important missions. God brings us to him, then we go for him. Once we are saved and we have new life, then we've got a burden to share that new life with others. So we see her at Jesus' feet pleading for life for others. So she's at his feet in sorrow. Then you see this incredible story, and you find this in, this story is actually in John 12, Mark 14, Luke chapter 7. It's called the Feast at Simon's House. And we're going to read it to you from the Gospel of Luke chapter 36. So there's a man, his name is Simon. Another passage, one of the scriptures calls him Simon the leper. Now Jesus would not go to the house of someone that had a, a full stage case of leprosy. The reason he's called Simon the leper is because he had been a leper and Jesus healed him. He's a Pharisee who's been healed by Christ. To thank Jesus, when Jesus comes to Bethany, he's a wealthy man, he has a feast in Jesus' honor. And Jesus comes and there's a lot of guests there. The apostles are all there. And in this story, Mary also shows up. What did I say, Luke? Luke 7:37. Oh, there, there we go. Thank you very much. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who is a sinner. Now, what's it calling her there? A woman and a sinner. But if you look in the other Gospels, it says Mary. It tells us who it was. A woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew Jesus sat at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask. It's a very precious stone flask. A fragrant oil. It's the oil they use for anointing kings and priests and sacrifice. And she stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. And you read the other gospel, it says she not only anointed his feet, but then she stood up and she poured it on his head and anointed his head. You know, Jesus was being anointed. The people who got anointed in the Bible was kings, priests, and a sacrifice. Jesus is our king. 
Jesus is our priest. Jesus is our sacrifice. Mary at his feet, she's where the church needs to be in worshiping God. And she made this incredible sacrifice. Judas, when he sees this going on, he's kind of annoyed because he's thinking, this is such an expensive gift. You read the other gospel, he says, this could have been sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. He didn't say this because he cared for the poor. He said it because he was a thief and he wanted to have a cut of that. It's interesting, here you've got Judas criticizing Mary's act of sacrifice and her act of worship. She's willing to kiss Jesus' feet and sacrifice and give to Jesus and worship him and serve him. Judas stole from Jesus and he kissed his face and betrayed him. Two people in the Bible are recorded as kissing Jesus, Judas and Mary. Judas wanted the highest position. He kissed his face and then betrayed him, sold him for money. Mary kissed his feet and then gave. And two attitudes, both claim to be religious. Very interesting. And Simon is watching this and everybody, when she breaks this vessel and they smell this fragrant oil that's made for kings, fills the room. She's not wanting to be a spectacle, but she wanted to do something for Jesus because she knew Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. He said it several times and the disciples thought there was some spiritual meaning they didn't understand. And Jesus is crossing the sea and he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples are going, oh, it's because we forgot our bread. We forgot our lunch. He said, no, now I'm speaking in spiritual terms. It's not lunch. I just fed 5,000 people. I'm saying, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees. So now when Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to die and I'll rise the third day, they're wondering what the spiritual meaning of that is. He's going, no, it's not spiritual. It's literal. But Mary got it. You know, most people give a gift after they're dead. She said, I want to give while he's alive. Amen. A lot of people are going to want to donate to the church right when they see Jesus come in in the clouds. It's going to be a little late then. It's like that sign in front of the Baptist church. It said, repent now and avoid the rush. <laughs> Everybody's going to wait till it's too late. And the way things are going in the world right now, you know, one of the best investments you can make in spreading the gospel. Amen. Noah was not sorry about the investment he made in the ark when it rose up on the waves. He floated a lot of stock, you might say, in that investment and had no regrets because his family was on the boat. Can you say amen? amen? So Simon sees this. He's the host of the, the dinner. And he's saying in himself, if Jesus was a prophet, he'd know who and what manner of woman this is who's touching him. For she's a sinner. Everybody in town knows about Mary. She's got that, that cottage business up in Magdala. And Jesus knew what he was thinking. Another sign that he's God. He said, Simon, I've got something to say to you. He said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor that had two debtors and one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Just call it dollars, $500, $50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, which of the two do you think will love him more? Simon said, well, I suppose the one who was forgiven more. Jesus said, you've rightly judged. He turned to the woman. It said, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. And that was customary back then. She's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. What does it mean, tears on the feet of Jesus? Tears are a symbol of sorrow. The Bible says he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He bore our sorrows and our grief. On the feet means he walked through them. He experienced them says, you didn't wash my feet. She's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. The Bible tells us in New Testament, a woman's hair is her glory. She humbled her glory before the Lord of glory. He said, you didn't greet me with a kiss. Now, I don't, it may seem weird to us, but you even read in the Bible, it says, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. I went to a particular denomination, I'll not name one time, first time I had visited there. And when I came in, all the men, men greeted each other and they kissed each other on the lips. And this was not in San Francisco. This was in New Mexico. <laughs> and I'm not even going to apologize for that. But anyway, and uh, 
I said, what's up? They said, don't worry. We just do it with each other because the Bible says greet the brethren with a holy kiss. I said, yeah, but you go to the Middle East, it's kind of like Russia. They kiss you on the cheek, you know, and they kiss you on the neck. It's what it says when Joseph met his father. Anyway, I don't want to take that too far, but <laughs> he said, you didn't greet me with a kiss. It was common to embrace and to kiss your guest. He said, but she's kissing my feet. And he said, her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loves much. For to whom much is forgiven, the same loves much. And he turned to the woman and he said, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Now she had heard that before. I do not condemn you. Now what is Jesus saying? That we need to be big sinners in order to really love him? He who is forgiven much loves much. I preached this sermon once years ago and a lady came to me. She said, I grew up in the church and I've never did anything really scandalous and I just feel like I just don't love Jesus like you and some of these other people. You share these wild testimonies and God saves you and, and uh, I think I got to go out there in the world and do some terrible prodigal debauchery things and come back to the Lord and, and then I'll really love the Lord. I said, heaven forbid. She said, but it says he who is forgiven much loves much and I've not done. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, Jesus is not saying you got to go commit a lot of sins and then he's saying you've got to know how big your sins are that you've already committed. Right. He who has a concept of how much they've been forgiven loves much. You are already a big sinner, friends. Congratulations, you qualify. <laughs> the Bible says that every sin is deadly and Jesus went to the cross for little sins. He went to the cross for our gossip and our indiscretions and our pride. So don't think you've got to go do something scandalous. The ones that the Lord had the hardest time reaching were the proud Pharisees and the scribes and the priests. He didn't have a problem reaching the, the publicans and the harlots, the Bible says. So there she is at his feet making this generous sacrifice. Then you go to the next point. In surrender at the cross. I remember uh, hearing a story about during World War I, they all fought in these foxholes and the fighting was brutal and France and America and Germany, they're just bombing uh, each other and, and this soldier was in a foxhole and the chaplain came to the front lines and he jumped into the foxhole and missiles and grenades are flying around and and the soldier reached into his shirt and he pulled out the cross he had been wearing. He said, Chaplain, how do you make this thing work? You'd be surprised how many people out there don't understand how to make it work. How do you get the cross to work? You can read about this here. It says in the Gospel of um, John, when uh, you read in chapter 23, actually I'm going to go to Luke 23. It says, all of his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance. When Jesus is on the cross, they stand at a distance. The disciples forsook him and fled. But look at John 19, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. Who stood by the cross? Mary Magdalene. When everybody forsake him, she was not ashamed. She loved him. She said, he stood by me when I was guilty. I'm going to stand by him when he's being falsely accused. Amen. You can tell who your real friends are. When everybody go, else goes out, your real friends come in. She saw Jesus on the cross and she knew he was there for her. Even Peter, who said, though all men forsake thee, I will not forsake thee. He denied the Lord and he fled with everyone else. And then finally they cowered back. The only people who stood up for Jesus when he hung on the cross was Mary there at the foot of the cross, his own mother who was with the apostle John. They came later. And the thief on the cross who called him Lord and King. And Mary was there at his feet as he's bleeding on the cross where she knew she belonged for her sins. Now friends, this is another one of those points that I just hope you won't miss. If we could go back 2,000 years, some of us, we'd get just enough religion and we hear it as we grow up. It's almost like you get enough to inoculate you against ever really catching the real thing. 
Kind of like you've been vaccinated against the real gospel. And we need to all get an industrial dose of what it means to be at the foot of the cross, to know what Jesus suffered for us. He experienced the most cruel torture that had been devised by man back then, the most humiliating torture. And he suffered not just the physical pain, but all the guilt and shame of the whole world. You think, how can a person handle that? He was not just a man, he was 100% God too. And he bore, the creator bore the sins of his whole creation and he did it as though you were the only one who had ever sinned. If you were the only one who had ever sinned, he would have done it for you because he loves you. Mary saw that. She somehow understood, he's hanging there for me. And so she had that devotion. She would stand by him. The Bible says that if you're a Christian, you may be persecuted. You may be mocked. Do you know the day is going to come when it's not popular to follow Jesus? I think the day is already here. And Christ said, if you are ashamed of me in this evil and adulterous generation, I'll be ashamed of you. But whoever confesses me in this evil and adulterous generation, I will confess his name before my Father and the angels in heaven. Do not be ashamed of Jesus. Amen. People in the world do the most bizarre things because they're not ashamed of the devil they serve. Why are we ashamed of the Lord? Amen. She was willing to stand by the cross. Amen. And we all need to be willing to stand up for Jesus. Amen. There she was. You know, there's a wonderful quote from a classic book called The Desire of Ages. And it says in page 83 of that book, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day contemplating the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As the, we thus dwell upon the great sacrifice for us, our confidence in Him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, we will be more deeply imbued with His Spirit, if we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. You know that song we sing, Jesus keep me near the cross. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. There are so many songs about the cross. Paul said, I am determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And you think, why would these Christians worship an implement of torture? It's not the cross, it's what happened there that demonstrates God's love for us and the devil's brutality. It shows you, it is basically the, the axis. It is the ground zero of the cosmic conflict between good and evil took place at the cross. There you've got the devil's love of power and Jesus' power of love is demonstrated. The mob is saying, crucify him, crucify him, and Jesus is saying, Father, forgive them. Amen. What a contrast, friends. She saw that all play out there. She saw his love and his thoughts, even for his mother. He declares his last will for his mother as he's hanging on the cross, worried about her. Next, you see her in service at the tomb. You know, the Bible tells us, you read in Mark 15, that uh, when Jesus died on the cross, that uh, the centurion gave the body to Joseph of Arimathea, this wealthy man who said, I'm going to give him my, my, uh, my grave. It was a rich man's grave. Prophecy said that he would be buried with the rich. He'd die among the wicked. He's crucified between thieves and buried in a rich man's tomb. And it says they took him down and they wrapped him in linen and they laid him in a sepulcher which was hewn out of rock. And it tells us that, you look, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. The women there were overseeing this process of wrapping the body of Jesus. They needed to go home and get some ointment but the Sabbath was approaching and they thought Jesus won't want us to do this on the Sabbath. We'll come back Sunday morning after the Sabbath was passed. You realize that it was still important to Jesus at that point. And I can't help but wonder when it came time to anoint the body after they had wrapped it in gauze, Mary probably was going to want to wrap his feet. You read in Luke 23, verse 55, And the women also that came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. Luke 22, 27, For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Yet I'm among you as one who serves. She was willing to serve. She helped oversee his, his body and, and caring for him and anointing him and uh, embalming him. 
Now the church, the bride of Christ, needs to be involved in service. Jesus said, I am your example in service. And then finally, we see her, it ends on a positive note. She is in song at the resurrection. This is a wonderful story. Turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 19, well, chapter 20, I guess, at this point. Go to the Gospel of John chapter 20. I've got all these flags in my Bible to help me find these quickly. Nothing's more boring than watching a pastor on TV turning his Bible. <laughs> so, when you read the different Gospels and you put the story together, Mary is the first one there. She gets there early in the morning, but she sees no one else is there and the stone's in the way. So she starts to make her way back up towards the city and she encounters the other women. And she says, how will we roll away the stone? They say, we don't know. We'll go, maybe some men will come and show up. So they go back. They see the stone is rolled away now and there's two angels sitting inside. And all the women leave and then Peter and John show up, except Mary stays. And Peter and John look inside they, they heard from the other women that the tomb was empty. The Roman soldiers had been scared off by this angel that threw away the tomb, uh, the, the stone. And Peter and John are so excited, they leave. But the one who stays is Mary. And she's standing at the tomb and people have been coming and going. The tomb is empty. And this is such a beautiful story. You look in verse 11, John chapter 20, verse 11. Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down. And once again, she looks in the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they've taken away, she doesn't say the Lord, they've taken away my Lord. And I know not where they have laid him. Is He the Lord for you? Is He my Lord? Is He your personal Lord and Savior? Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and didn't know it was Jesus. This happens other times after the resurrection. Her eyes are probably all red from weeping through the weekend. And Jesus says, Woman, why are you weeping? And the word woman there, you know, in the, my hippie days, we used to call some, hey, woman, it was like derogatory. But, you know, in Bible times, the word here translates madam. It's a term of respect and honor. So when I first read that, I thought, wow, he wasn't being very nice to his mother. He said, woman. But that meant madam, okay? He said, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposing him to be the gardener. She was actually right. He was a gardener. The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden. Jesus wept in the garden of Gethsemane and said, not my will, thy will be done. And where he was crucified, there was a garden. And the Bible says in Revelation, he's going to bring us back to the garden and we'll eat again from the tree of life. Jesus is a gardener and he wants you to bring forth fruit. Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. That always is, that amazes me. Because, you know, I, I always am annoyed by these medieval paintings of Jesus looking all thin and anorexic. And Jesus was a carpenter. They did not have power tools back then. He was a man's man. He disappeared in a crowd of fishermen. They didn't know which he, one he was. And here you've got Jesus. You know, you figure he's a six-foot man. And here you've got this slight woman. And she says, I will carry him away. She thought maybe... The Jews were afraid that the tomb was going to be worshipped and they evicted the body. After all, it was someone else's tomb and she doesn't know. She says, where is he? I will carry him away. And I just, in my mind, I picture Mary was willing to try to pick up the body of Jesus and carry it. She had that kind of dedication. And then Jesus says to her, Mary. He knows your name, friends. He's calling your name. She heard that voice before. The Bible says, Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus cast seven devils says that over and over in the Bible. Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus cast seven devils. And that doesn't mean at one time, like the demoniac, he cast out seven. The way it's treated in the Bible is seven different times she had fallen back and he saved her again and forgave her again and saved her again. Amen. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. And you can read in the book of Job, he will deliver you in six troubles. Yes, in seven, evil will not touch you. There she is, faithfully, standing outside of the tomb. 
worshiping the Lord. Now, if I was in charge of things, I would have organized the resurrection differently. If I was Jesus, when I rose from the dead, first thing I'd do is I'd walk off to the high priest and say, here I am. Now what do you think? <laughs> well, I would have stormed in on Pilate and say, surprise. <laughs> but Jesus did something very unusual. You think that, you know, he would have first revealed himself to his mother or to Peter or James or John or one of the apostles, but he waits until they all come and they go. And he deliberately waits to reveal himself to the least of the least. That woman, they said, don't let her touch you. She's a sinner because she represents the church. You know, the Bible tells us God told the prophet Hosea, I want you to go take a bride of the harlots. I want you to marry a harlot and I want you to love her. And this is sort of what God has done with the church is he said, I'm willing to save the lost. Peter said, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. He said, I came to save people like you. And when he came and saved Zacchaeus, they said, don't you know he's a sinner? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost, publicans and sinners and harlots. You are not a bigger sinner than Jesus is a Savior. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he decided, I'm going to reveal myself first to a prostitute saved by grace. And he'll say, I do not condemn you. Not only did he say, go and sin no more, he then tells Mary, go and tell the others that I'm alive. The great commission is given to Mary. He's not yet ascended to heaven. She goes to grab his feet and worship him. He says, don't cling to me. I've got to go to my father. But I waited for you. Till everyone was gone, I want to tell you. I want, because you understood devotion and service and love, I'm saving that honor for you. Now you go tell them I'm alive. I'll show myself to them later. Friends, he wants to do that with each of you and those of you who are watching and listening right now. We're all sinners. We're all big sinners. Amen? Amen. And we have a big Savior. But we must have a personal love, devotion relationship with him. Do you want to have that relationship, friends? Let's ask him now as we close, can we? Loving Father, we thank you for this great story of Mary. These vignettes that show her at your feet in service, in love, in sacrifice, in sorrow, in study, in surrender, and in song, celebrating your new life, that new life that you offer to us. Lord, I pray that we can all embrace that and believe that we can have that experience. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, God bless you, friends who are watching. We Tune in again tomorrow night. We're going to be here through this week, 7 o'clock Pacific time, continuing with inspiration.